out to today's webcast entitled VEVRA and Section 503, What You Need to Know. My name is Maribel Gregory. I'm a project manager with Thomas Houston. The goal of today's webcast is to provide you with a better understanding of the requirements of the new and revi revised regulations, so let's get started. The revised changes in the regulations have to do with strengthening the current affirmative action and obligations of federal contractors overall. The was that increased contractor accountability for compliance will ultimately increase job opportunities for protected veterans and individuals with disabilities. And regulations are addressed in different sections as follows. Subpart A, which addresses preliminary matters in the Equal Opportunity Clause. Subpart B, which addresses prohibited discrimination. C, which addresses the Affirmative Action Program requirements. Sub E, addresses general enforcement and complaint procedures. And subpart E, addresses ancillary matters. Um, and subpart D is mostly informational, not really a whole lot uh, that federal contractors have to do. a few key dates with regards to the regulations. Um, the new and revised regulations were published initially on September 24, 2013. A, B, D, and E of the and revised regulations became effective for all contractors on March 24, 2014. However, subpart C of the regulations, which really addresses all of the affirmative action program requirements, has an approach. And then that federal contractors, subcontractors uh, had to implement the request under this subpart by their next plan date after the March 24, 2014 date. So this mean to you with regards to the phased in timeline uh, for the implementation of part C of the regs. Basically, if your last completed plan date was between April 1st of 2014 and December 1st of 2014, the data collection requirements under subpart C should now be fully implemented. Uh, the reporting and assessment requirements under subpart C will begin with your 2015 affirmative action plan. However, if your next plan date after the March 24th, 2014 date was between January 1st, 2015 and March 1st, 2015, then the deduction requirements were implemented with your 2015 Affirmative Action Plan. And for you, that means you were probably um, working on that just recently or completing it since the mandate fell within these, uh, the first three months of this year. Then the requirement was to at least complete it by then. Uh, you've done it prior as a choice, but in terms of the requirement, it had to be completed at least by your next plan date. Reporting and assessment requirements um, of subpart C, if your plan date, next plan date after that March 24, 14 date was between those three months of the beginning of this year, then the report assessment requirements of subpart C begin with your 2016 affirmative action plan, which means you have a little bit more time. We're going to review key provisions under the VEVRA regulations. First of all, um, CFR 60-250, which addressed all of VEVRA requirements, has been rescinded and replaced by 60-200. The VEVRA report uh, is now obsolete, and the thought was that there were no longer any contracts outstanding uh, prior that predated the December 1, 2003 date. The provisions added to permit veterans um, previously covered by Part 250 to file discrimination and retaliation complaints. One moment, I'm trying to get rid of that. The other protected veteran category replace 
with the duty wartime or campaign badge veteran category. Now, for revising the regs has to do with the fact that the framework of the REB was unchanged since 1970. These regulations for employment discrimination against protected veterans, you know, statistics show that veterans still face substantial employment obstacles in the civilian workforce. For example, in 2012, the employment rate for Gulf War era II veterans was almost 10% as compared to non veterans. A little under 8%. Marins earn about 3% less than non veterans, and for females, it's worse. Uh, male veterans earn approximately 6.5% less than non veterans. Regarding the disabled regulations and individuals with disabilities, the unemployment rate of individuals with disabilities is about 15%, much better than uh, their counterpart. Where national average for individuals without disabilities is only at 8%. Under the disabled regulations, the definition of disability has been extended, and basically, Congress, Americans with Disabilities Amendment Act, um, up to an eight. Sorry, the Americans with Disabilities Act Amendment Act of 2008, after the Supreme Court had a series of um, rulings and decisions that very narrowly defined disability. Therefore, individuals that, that have impairments such as cancer or diabetes or depression were not, um, were not protected based on the Supreme Court rulings then. Uh, therefore, Congress wanted to ensure that, that individuals that had these impairments would be afforded the protections that were intended under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So now the definition, as I said, is expanded, and that definition is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, a word or past history of such an impairment, or being regarded as having a disability. Uh, for disabilities now include but are not limited to the following, and what you see here on the screen, as I mentioned, cancer, diabetes, autism, depression, bipolar disorder, PTSD, and it could also include um, any other disabilities not listed here. And basically, the the onus now is, and, and what the OFCCP is trying to do here, is really they're putting more onus on federal contractors and subcontractors to provide reasonable accommodations. Under 503, um, contractors must provide the notice of rights to applicants and employees. And this is basically the EEO is the law poster. It's always a requirement under the revised regulations. Now contractors using an electronic application process are now required to provide the notice of rights uh, poster electronically. And you can set this requirement by adding a link to the poster on the main page of your career site. Uh, that poster should be saved with the application. Additionally, the new revised regs provided an option for employers that have employees with telework arrangements uh, to provide the poster electronically to those employees as long as the company has actual knowledge that those employees have access to the electronic posting. And the notice must be posted in a conspicuous online location. Contractors must ensure the notice is accessible to employees and applicants with a disability, which that contractors should, for example, have copies in Braille available or post the poster at a level viewable by a person in a wheelchair or possibly email a copy if that um, is requested and, and makes the poster accessible. Section 503, there's a new EEO tagline requirement for MADS. And basically, the stipulation here is that the shortest abbreviation allowed for a reference to veteran in the EEO tagline 
a protected veteran, if you will, uh, is VET. The shortest abbreviation allowed for individual with a disability is the word disabled. So you can expand on that. You can have a whole paragraph, but not um, make reference to those protected classes using any shorter abbreviation than the one presented here. And uh, we also provided here an example of a compliant tagline, as you can see. Um, we're allowed to use the first initial for the minority, the first initial of the word uh, female for females. Um, that's allowed. But in terms of veteran and disabled, you should not go any shorter than what is noted here. And Section 503, uh, the Equal Opportunity Clause was revised to include required language for contracts, subcontracts, and purchase orders, by the way. The language is specific, cannot be altered, including the fact that it has to be in bold font. Um, so that is now mandatory language that is required. Um, however, note that contractors, subcontractors, you can use one O clause that contains the three regulation references with regards to Executive Order 11246, which covers minorities and females for protected veterans and Section 503 for individuals with disabilities. You can use one clause with the reference to those three regulations, and that will satisfy all EO clause requirements. Um, Contractors and subcontractors have always been required to set their external job postings, um, except for the few exceptions which have, to, which have to do with the very high level positions or positions that you're posting internally only, or if a position should last less than three days. Outside of that, any other job opening would have to be sent to your local employment service office. Uh, there are now additional requirements. Um, and there's additional information that has to be provided to your local employment service office at least once a year. And that includes to indicate that your organization is a federal contractor or subcontractor, uh, to provide the name and location of the hiring, hiring official so that they're fully aware of who they may contact should they have referrals to provide. You make the request for priority referrals of protected veterans. And if your organization uses third-party search firms or recruitment agencies, you must also provide their contact information as applicable. Uh, should any of this information change throughout the year, should you add an agency, uh, then you also should update the information needed. And this has to be done at least once every year. Under to notify labor organizations and employee representatives of, of work organizations requesting their cooperation for non-discrimination in their employment practices. This should be done um, writing, and you should keep the documentation. Um, if you meet with um, your labor organizations, then you should also document the date of those meetings and um, who attend, who were the attendees. Oh, three, the disabled regulations, they address um, acts that are, to, are considered discriminatory and prohibited. And they clear, make it very clear that it is unlawful to enter contracts or relationships that would deny employment or benefit opportunities to individuals with disabilities. It is unlawful to, to provide reasonable accommodations to otherwise qualified applicants and employees with a disability. Unlawful deny employment opportunities to otherwise qualified applicants and employees with a disability based on the need of the contractor to provide a reasonable accommodation. Uh, again, really emphasizing that uh, contractors should make effort to provide reasonable accommodations unless they impose an undue business hardship, which defined as an action requiring significant difficulty or expense. And the size of the organization into consideration uh, with regards to what would constitute uh, creating an undue business hardship so that larger organizations with more resources are expected to be able to do more. 
some organizations with less resources um, would not be held at that same standard. In addition, in regards to you know, discrimination that is prohibited, contracts should review and revise qualification standards, tests, and other selection criteria to ensure the criteria is job related and consistent with business necessity. Um, because otherwise that would be considered uh, discriminatory if it isn't. It is best practice, therefore, to ensure that physical and mental qualifications are included in all job postings and are reviewed periodically and updated as soon as there is a change. Regarding to um, prohibited discrimination and compensation, the reg clearly indicate that it is unlawful to reduce the amount of compensation offered because of disability-related benefits that an individual receives outside of their employment with the organization. It is lawful to reduce the amount of compensation offered due to the actual or anticipated cost of a reasonable accommodation the individual um, made or may request. Um, to save regulations, Section 503, uh, there are medical examinations and inqu inquiries that are per uh, permitted, and, and those are outlined. It is permitted to have pre conduct pre-employment inquiries on the ability to perform job-related functions with or without a reasonable accommodation. Permitted to have pre-employment medical exams that a condition of employment it's part of your typical process for all entering employees in the same job category or title. Once again, as long as it's consistently applied, that, that is permitted. It's permitted to use to exclude applicants if criteria, again, is job-related and consistent with business necessity and can show that essential functions of the positions cannot be accomplished with a reasonable accommodation or may also have voluntary medical exams that are part of an employee health program. Those may not be job-related, and that should be clearly communicated that um, if an employee um, is participating in that, they should be made aware that, that those types of exams are not job-related at all. And this area and section of the regulations um, indicates to invite applicants to self-identify as an individual disability and we're also going to be talking a little bit more about that. Under Section 503, um, the regulations now very clearly indicate that contractors must provide a notice to employees and applicants regarding the ability to request and review the affirmative action plan. This would exclude data metrics. This notice has to be conspicuously posted at each establishment, and keep in mind it is for both employees and applicants. So it's not to have it, uh, for example, in an employee break room. You have to make sure that uh, those notices are posted where applicants would be able to see them as well. So really it should be at the uh, entrance of your facility as well. Uh, notice must provide the hours and location during which the program may be requested for review. And keep in mind, again, this is for um, the veterans and and the uh, Individuals with Disabilities Affirmative Action Plan, this is not regarding an already female affirmative action plan. Under 503, uh, contractors are now required to provide the pre-offer invitation to self-identify. You must invite applicants to self-identify as either a protected veteran or an individual with a disability. This can be done when collecting other demographic information, such as when you're also providing the self-ID for race, gender information. For the individuals with disabilities, that is now a, a mandatory form that was provided by the OFCCP. It cannot be altered. It has to be that specific form. And for organizations that are building that into their uh, ATS system, for example, you really do have to maintain the integrity of that form in terms of font size and however that um, data is provided in the form. Um, contractors may also identify an applicant or employee as an individual with a disability even if they chose not to self-identify. This has to be based on obvious disability or that that individual uh, 
uh, made an accommodation request. And we suggest and recommend, and these are all new, but we had a really good question about you know, what if something comes up in casual conversation, um, not because of, you know, you can see it, or even that an accommodation request was made. And the consensus was that it really should be based on the fact that you can see the disability uh, visually or that accommodation request was made so that it shouldn't be based on, you know, over in ca casual conversation, for example, that someone has diabetes. Um, that would not really fall into this um, definition here. Section 503, contractors must now in the policy statement, include your title state's executive name and indicate their support for the affirmative action plan. For organizations that have various uh, different business segments where you might have a president of that business segment, that would not be the name. We, uh, the OFCCP is looking for your pretty much CEO of the entire organization within the United States. Uh, for our and clients, we have uh, um, I'll write that into our process and that we're asking you for that name so that we can include in your EEO policy statement. Uh, one here is that uh, the CEO does not have to sign. If, you know, if there are certain individuals of a the facility, the president of that facility can sign the EEO policy statement. It's just that the CEO's name must be mentioned in the EEO policy statement. Under three, um, kind of required to conduct the annual review of personnel processes. And what was here has to do with ensuring equal access to those processes. And the revised regulations encourage making information and communication technologies accessible. Uh, however, this is not a requirement. Uh, it would not, not you know, be a violation if you did not make your communication technologies accessible regarding your personnel processes. And you must ensure that personnel processes do not stereotype individuals with disabilities. Under Bill 3, uh, contractors, I mean, the relations now indicate that contractors, as a matter of affirmative action, have an obligation to inquire if they may need a reasonable accommodation if a performance problem is noted. Their idea is that um, if you have an issue, uh, you want to train your, your management team to, in a very confidential matter, if they see that, that the performance issue may be related to um, an individual's disability, to determine if a reasonable accommodation may be needed. This Speculations really emphasizes the contractor's obligation to provide reasonable accommodations unless, once again, it can do business hardship. The regulations indicate that it is a best practice to implement formal reasonable accommodation procedures, but once again, it's not required. It is just intended as a best practice. Under 503, contractors must send written notification of the company's EEO policy all contractors, including uh, your subcontracting vendors and suppliers. And basically, the recruitment works this way. If you, your organization as a federal contractor meets the regulations and, and you are a federal contractor or subcontractor, that means that under uh, VEVRA, you have at least 50 employees and a single contract or contract is greater than or equal to $100,000. If that is the case, you must send a written notification of your EEO policy statement to all of your subcontractors. And your, uh, the regulations for individuals with disabilities, once again, is you, your organization has a contract or subcontract that is greater or equal to 50000 a full contract, and you also have 50 employees in total, then you must send uh, the notification of your EEO policy statement and to all of your subcontractors, vendors, and suppliers. The requirement is only to provide the notice and also document compliance, for example, the date that you may have sent the letter, um, but you do not have to conduct any follow-up. It's really a matter of just putting your vendors, subcontractors, your suppliers on notice 
but that would be the requirement not to have to track it and, and determine, you know, where they respond to you. That is not the requirement. Section 503, um, the OFCCP provided an expanded list of recruitment resources. Um, you'll see some here on the screen that they recommended, for example, the Department of Veterans Affairs, that would be uh, the, the local regional office in your location. Uh, basically, the idea here is that, you know, they are, with these regulations, have, have put a, uh, requirements on contractors to conduct additional outreach and recruitment for protected veterans and individuals with disabilities. They're listing uh, sources for you, and basically so that is so that there is no excuse. In other words, to say, you know, we want you to conduct this outreach, and by the way, here are some sources um, so that you have somewhere to go, and, you know, there's no reason for you to say, well, we really can't identify a source. Keep in mind, they're not, you know, you don't have to use those sources. Contractors may still use self-identified resources. The important thing here is to make the effort and to be able to show that that effort has been conducted. On 503, there is a new requirement to not only conduct the initial outreach, which actually was always a requirement, but what's really new here has to do with documenting it, um, assessing what are the results of, of that outreach, and retaining the records for three years. At that, um, in the audit scheduling letter, they have now included a request for uh, contract or contractors to, to, to show that information, so they want documentation documentation, and basically the request reads as such in the letter, result of the evaluation of the effectiveness of outreach and recruitment efforts that were intended to identify and recruit qualified protective veterans um, and individuals with disabilities. So that request is there, and you will have to produce that documentation. It really needs to be documented. Basically, they're looking for um, all of the uh, good faith efforts, events, Special recruiting sources that your organization utilized. And as I mentioned, they want you to now assess that on an annual basis, assess the effectiveness of the outreach effort. Um, that, sh that assessment needs to be a written narrative. It should be included as a, a you know, a narrative. And you should then also, if you determine that certain outreach efforts really are not fruitful, were not helpful, they're looking for or, um, contractors to it, what would be an alternative effort? What are you looking at since this effort really didn't yield what you were looking for? Um, again, you must document uh, the documentation of the uh, outreach efforts and, and the effort. But find that sometimes, you know, this means you, let you um, identify a source and uh, you may not receive referrals referrals, but you may have really made a, a good relationship, and it may be something that really would still be um, something that you can indicate that is fruitful um, and have resulted in something immediately, but you're, you think that that is going to produce. So I would say that would be something you would indicate, um, and you're going to continue to pursue it in the hopes that you, would, you may potentially Girls. If you continue down that road for several years and nothing comes out of it, then you know uh, you may want to then think about an alternative effort. So what? Like, and on this slide, um, you'll see an excerpt of a sample THA template that we will be providing to all of our THA clients. Um, really, it's an Excel spreadsheet to help you track and maintain the information that's required. Once again. You know, all events or functions, activities attended. Um, this would include, again, calls made to specialized organizations, what were the dates of attendance, um, who did those meetings, uh, contacts that were identified, again, that might really be fruitful in the future, uh, of what were the objectives of the event, the function, the activity, and mostly what was the outcome in terms of did you have any referrals? And this is probably going to be the biggest challenge, but federal contractors should really 
look to see about how they can go about tracking and referrals received and what was the outcome. Uh, did they meet the minimal qualifications or not? Uh, they interviewed and eventually they hired. That type of information the OFCCC is looking for. Um, again, assessing if the objectives were met as expected and providing that as a written summary. 503, um, contractors are required to include the EEO policy in their policy manual or employee handbook. And must again notify union officials of the EEO policy and request their cooperation. Under 3, um, there was a requirement for contractors to have a self audit and reporting system. But again, they've added additional um, requirements here that have to do with uh, the election and assessment. So, under the regs, you must now document the actions taken to measure the effectiveness of the affirmative action program, indicate any need for remedial action, determine the degree to which objectives have been attained. And although this sounds similar to what we were just reviewing, that was specific to outreach and recruitment efforts. This has to do with the AAP as a whole. Uh, determining whether known protected veterans or individuals with disabilities have had the opportunity to participate in all sponsored events, such as recreational activities, social activities, training, et cetera. Uh, measuring the contractor's compliance with the affirmative action program's specific obligations and again, document the actions taken to comply with these obligations and, retain, and retaining those records for three years. Now that in the new audit um, letter, which was uh, revised and put into place October of last year, they have now added a request for this information. And it shows up on that letter as documentation of all actions taken to comply with the audit and report reporting system requirements. And what does this look like um, regarding measuring the effectiveness of the AAP? So, for example, the annual required goals met or not, if not why. Um, has underutilization from the prior year improved? Has a new implemented good faith effort made a difference? Did the organization implement a new ATS system? If so, um, what was the what were the results? What was the impact? Um, indicating any need for remedial action, you know, are there additional good faith efforts being considered to address underutilization? Um, is there any training planned for recruiters or management regarding compliance of the selection process? Determining to which the contractors' objectives have been obtained. Uh, were new relationships with recruiting sources fruitful? Was a new targeted program implemented? Um, again, what was the impact? Uh, determine whether protected veterans and individuals with disabilities have had the opportunity to participate in events. Um, this could actually relate to or walk individuals access to the information. Um, would they be able to gain access to the event? Um, you know, in terms of pathways and parking and that type of info, um, those types of things. So, um, these are types of ex uh, these examples of what would satisfy your organization of your self audit. Under a benchmark for hiring, and it is not all, it is a benchmark, and the OE will allow two methods for staff that benchmark. First of all, you can apply the national percentage of veterans in the civilian well, just changed today. It is now 7%, so they did reduce it uh, somewhat. But uh, up until this morning, it was 7.2%. It is now 7%, and that will be updated annually or as needed, as we saw. Um, or your organization can establish an individual benchmark using the specified factors that the OFCCP has provided. Um, and the there is that, you know, organizations may feel that they are located in a remote location where the population is probably not as high as the national um, percentage. So, you 
can, you know, determine to establish your own benchmark using those five factors that they have provided. And something else to keep in mind is that for organizations that have multiple of action plans, you can actually alternate and use the national benchmark, or you can establish the individual benchmark for certain plans versus others. What are those for um, coming up with a hiring benchmark for protected veterans? Well, it is the average percentage of vets in the civilian labor force in your particular state location where your plan is. Um, it is the percentage of the veterans who participated in the employment service delivery system, in the, again, in the particular state where your affirmation plan location is located. Um, your own data regarding um, received applicants and higher ratios of protected veterans. So looking at your data, say, from within a two-year period, was the percentage of protected veterans that you received uh, as referrals in, in terms of what is the percentage of applicants to total that were protected veterans? And that increased, has that decreased? Also looking at um, your of outreach and recruitment efforts and any other factor that your organization believes would tend to affect the availability of protected veterans in that in your location. Um, truly, the Department of Labor does make it make this a little bit, you know, they want to make it difficult, so they provide the database for you to research that state data. So it's not difficult. It's pretty easy to go to the website and um, put the information of your location and you will get the percentages that were indicated here, at least in the first two bullets. On the regulations, there is now a utilization goal requirement. Um, so just as where you have to establish, where you have to establish a minority female uh, utilization goal, uh, you now have that requirement to, to establish it for individuals uh, with disabilities, and it is at a 7% um, it's a percent utilization goal, and this is to be applied by job group for individuals with disabilities. Um, your total workforce in its entirety, all locations, is 1,100 employees, then you can apply this utilization goal on a bottom line basis. Otherwise, it must be a, uh, calculated by job group. And once again, we are uh, developing that uh, reports for our time. Houston clients, we will be able to determine how to apply it, and it will just be part of your affirmative action plans moving forward as required. Um, once again, here you must invite employees to self-identify as an individual with a disability, and um, this is re with reference to employees. So this is the uh, post offer requirement, which always existed, but you have to do it at the time of hire and at least one time every five years thereafter. Section 503, um, there are the new debt collection and analysis requirements that have to do with tracking the number of individuals with disabilities and protected veteran applicants, the number of applicants for all jobs, the number of job openings, and the number of jobs filled, the number of individuals with disabilities um, that were hired as well as protected veterans that were hired, and total number of applicants hired. Um, we'll be able to pretty much come up with all of this data except for one statistic that's now required here, and it has to do with the number of job openings. Um, I'm going to review that a little bit more moving forward. But I wanted to point out that uh, in the new audit scheduling letter, this is also now requested, and it reads as follows. Documentation of the computations or comparisons described in such and such um, regulation for the immediately preceding year and for any audit where you are more than six months into your current plan year, the remaining part of that statement is that you will also have to provide it for um, that update period. So, in terms of number of plan year, the OCP is that this is the total number of job openings refers to the individual positions advertised as open in a job vacancy announcement or requisition. As an example, 
If one vacancy announcement or requisition includes five open positions and it results in four hires, then the contractor would document this as five openings, four jobs filled. So it's enough for your organization to be able to determine what was that total number of job openings throughout the year, uh, which means that some positions, you know, canceled would be in that total, um, but just not filled for whatever reason, um, that would be in that total. And we not be able to gather that from your data, just the data that has always been provided. That's a new statistic that, that um, clients will have to provide. In terms of filled, um, first, as I mentioned, THA will determine it from the data. But the guidance is job filled refers to all jobs the company filled by any means, be it through a competitive or non-competitive process, and it should take into account both new years as well as and were placed into new positions because uh, they were promoted, again, either competitive or non, um, a competitive or non-competitive process, transfers and reassignments. Uh, the data uh, that was specified, the number of applicants that self-identified as an individual with a disability and the number of applicants that self-identified as a protected veteran. Your organization has put those um, forms in place, the pre-offer self-ID forms, that's great, but we just want to make sure and, and uh, as the need to be able to translate that into reportable data. So once again, we will be able to pull that for clients as long as it's reported. Um, the number of individuals with disabilities and protected vet applicants that were hired, um, that really comes from your post-offer forms as well as pre-offer because because if you've put it in the pre-offer and they filled the form out, then that would show up. But again, post offer always provides an opportunity to get data. Um, there are of total applicants during the plan year. Well, we rely on your applicant flow disposition. So again, emphasizing that you have good disposition codes in place that differentiate between applicant and candidate. Uh, but again, you are always required to provide applicant flow data and we generally will pull that from your um, profile using those dispositions. Okay, um, new specification here that, that contractors and subcontractors may develop and implement training and employment for employees with disabilities, but this is not a requirement. It's encouraged, it's basically thought of as a best practice, but not a requirement. 503, um, sub E, the ancillary matters, really what needs to be noted here is just that they're emphasizing that the new data collection requirements, um, there is a three-year, you know, documenting requirement. You must retain the records of your outreach and recruitment activities for three years. Uh, as regs, you may still combine the uh, veteran and disabled narratives. And another thing to note for uh, contractors is that a disabled veteran can also be counted as an individual with a disability. And again, um, with that whole thought of trying to, to have contractors provide reasonable accommodation, you know, making that as, as possible as it can be, the regulations indicate that you can allow an employee to provide their own accommodation or even pay the difference regarding what the reasonable accommodation cost is. So what you would determine to be reasonable if, it, if the providing accommodation is, you know, more expensive than that, then let that in, that uh, employee pay that difference. To remind our clients that we have created a toolkit that's very comprehensive regarding all of these revised uh, relation requirements, that toolkit is, is our HR Resource Center site. It is under the Compliance Tools link on your left navigation bar. And then body, once you click on that, it will say Compliance Tools. Once again, you would click that. And then you would look for Section 503. And we have these tools there for your use. There's a quick reference guide, a compliance worksheet, and all of the various templates that you may need to implement some of these requirements in terms of letters and the new self-ID forms and which that may need to be provided on your website. Um, Guys, just to mention very quickly, that is meant for you to be able to print and keep it handy 
is it, it lists all of the regulations that were revised um, or, or that were new in the same order as the compliance worksheet. The reference guide doesn't give you as much information. The compliance worksheet gives you all of the details regarding that, that um, regulation. Um, and the toolkit templates will include the EEO is law poster, um, the tag, examples of taglines that are compliant with the new regs. Um, in terms of the information that you have to provide your local employment service office, there is a template letter that you can use. So we really recommend that you go to the site and check this out because we've laid it all out there for your use so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. This year, we just want to mention that you know, you feel the need that uh, other employees in your organization may need some assistance with this. We offer a one-hour consult. We can offer one-hour consultation with your team, up to 20 uh, attendees, which would be a walk through the regs, similar to what we're doing here, um, or consulting hours that you may want to use on an ad hoc basis. You, you can choose at, as well as an hour, so that you can use that for emails that uh, the email us questions or, or just to you know call us sporadic through the year as you're working on implementation. Our core services include affirmative action plan preparation and um, compliance review representation, but we also provide enough services regarding um, compliance with affirmative action and EEO. Um, so we just wanted to list those here, remind you, you know, we provide EEO 1 and vets reports, we provide training. So if there's anything uh, that you think your organization may need, please call, and here's our contact information, and you can send us questions at info at thomashouston.com, or again, you can give us a call, and I hope this um, was helpful, and this session is recorded and will be provided on the HR Resource Center site, and will also be provided on our company website for non-clients. Thank you much, and have a great day.